There are already laws that govern human interactions with nature, for example, safeguarding certain wildlife or granting land protection status. This week, in a report for the Law Society, it's been argued that we should grant legal rights to non-human entities such as animals, trees and rivers. The purpose of the report is, quote, meaningful coexistence and, quote, new alliances for cooperation instead of competition. Such a change in legislation would have very important consequences, as the report hints. It points out that if rights were granted to non-humans or living systems, then questions of liability for damage to the environment, such as climate change or biodiversity loss, arise. Well, you can regard that as an effective protection for the environment or a nightmare of litigation whenever we want to build a house, dig a sewer or lay a cable. Should we change the law in a way that implies that humans and animals, or for that matter, humans and trees, humans and rivers, are of the same moral order? The Conservative peer Lord Moylan has written extensively about the concept of animal sentience, and he joins me now. It's very good to see you, Daniel. Um, This is not entirely about animal sentience, although that that might be a, a, a part of it. What do you think of the idea of giving rights to non human actors? Well, it's a fascinating topic, isn't it? And it raises lots of interesting problems. And uh, I think the first thing I'd say is that it's a tremendous impoverishment of legal thinking that they can only think in terms of rights, that if you want to achieve something, it has to be by granting rights. And this has been the growth of the rights culture in the legal mind to the exclusion of everything else over the last 40 or 50 years. There is another way of thinking about it, of course, and that is that human beings are a higher order of life, but with that comes a sense of obligation, and we already articulate that. We put obligations on human beings in certain places, in certain ways, as you said, to protect certain types of landscapes or rivers or natural features, to treat animals in a way which is um, what we would call humane, because the moral order is a, is a human thing. It's not, a, it's, it's not something in which uh, rocks and rivers participate. So it's an, first of all, it's an impoverishment. But the second thing I think that I'd want to say about it is that there are two ways in which the state is expanding in new ways into controlling our lives. And one of them is driven by climate change because the, 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 the essence of this report is the notion of... Um, uh, climate change is partly driving this. Um, and, um, a- and the other way is through health uh, and through an expansion of um, uh, control over our health and, um, and, and driving our behaviour on, 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 on health, uh, health grounds. Well, that's not in contention this morning. But the question about expanding um, government control on the basis of climate change um, is, is very clear. And and I think we need to be very, very wary about this because that's what's behind it. It's really a a means of control. 